starts right now. Talk of safer gun laws never stops for the families of the Robb Elementary mass shooting. They've demanded change from our governor and are now focusing in on a local business. An unforgivable act. Just some of the words from the family speaking out after the arrest of an accused hit and run driver. What else they have to say to the accused? And we continue our coverage of the five year anniversary of Hurricane Harvey that affected areas like Rockport. We'll explain how leaders are planning to rebuild the structures that keep Rockport safe from storms. Up first tonight, Uvalde families are continuing their fight to change gun laws three months after the Robb Elementary mass shooting. Yesterday, we showed you dozens who rallied at the state capitol demanding the governor call for a special session to raise the age to purchase an assault-style weapon. Some families tell the night team's Lee Waldman they're calling on a Uvalde business to do its part. From the classroom, and yes, that is from the bullet. Bullets. She had just made that this one this year. Some of the last items they ever touched, Uzziah Garcia and Amory Jo Garza. I never ever want a mother to sit here and go through this. It was the worst pain. We just want her to know that. <laughs> We love her so much. Three months later, the pain of the loss, still just as fresh. Families are turning this pain into action, sending a petition letter at the beginning of August to local sporting goods store Oasis Outback to stand with its community and stop selling assault-style rifles and ammo. Just to show some respect and compassion for the families. Oasis is where the gunman bought two AR-15s used in the attack. Thousands of signatures, thousands of people that mailed that letter in, so I'm hoping that we get a response from them. Well, we asked for a response within 30 days. Yes. Meanwhile, 60 miles east in Divine, these families have a big supporter for their calls for change. Bernie Phillip has been an NRA member for more than 50 years, until May 24th. I see him in, the, in my dreams, really, and it really bothers me. Because I said, man, that could be my granddaughter. His granddaughter, Sophie, is 10. She marched with families in Austin yesterday, calling for common sense gun law changes, like raising the age to buy an assault style rifle to at least 21. Philip thinks they need to be banned altogether. Any gun or weapon that has 40 rounds, it belongs to the police. If Oasis Outback doesn't comply, families have vowed to fight just like they have for the last three months. We too felt like we failed her, not trying, not fighting harder to get in. And we're not gonna fail them a second time. As of today, Ariola says they have not received any response back from Oasis Outback. The stores closed on Sundays. We did try to call. We will try to call again tomorrow as well for comment on the petition letter that was sent. Back here at home, a San Antonio family is speaking out after the arrest of a woman in connection with the death of Mariano Lugo. We first gave you this update last night on the Night Beat. 29-year-old Mercedes Haynes is accused of driving a car that hit and killed Lugo while he was on his motorcycle. Security camera footage from a nearby grocery store captured the aftermath of that crash. It showed Haynes with four other people gathering items from inside that vehicle, then taking off. Lugo's wife says she understands accidents happen, but to leave him for dead is unforgivable. She's just cold hearty, like you have no heart. But I hope you get what you deserve. Now, despite that they are still grieving right now, the family is also grateful for the time they had spent with him and the memories left behind. He was a nice person. He was a very nice, he would help anybody. He would even take off his shoes to give them to somebody. He will help everybody. He was the life of the party. He always made us laugh and, you know, he, his vibe was very good. Everybody was just like, he was someone good to hang out with. Haynes now charged with failure to stop and render aid resulting in death. The San Antonio police say an ongoing feud within a family led to one man being shot overnight. Police were called to the scene around 11 p.m. at the home on Orphan Street near North New Braunfels Avenue. According to police, the 46-year-old man was found inside a vehicle bleeding heavily from a gunshot wound to the forearm. He was taken to a nearby hospital and police are still looking for the suspect. 
In other news, a family grieving tonight after a house fire claimed the lives of two pet birds on the south side. Firefighters were called to the scene around 5 p.m. on Betty Street near Salazar Samora Street. When they arrived, smoke could be seen from the back of the house. It was quickly contained to one room. Fire officials say damage is estimated to be about $80,000. They believe the electrical issue was the cause. No other injuries were reported. Making, uh, making uh, headlines in politics, there is a stall in the race for Texas governor for Democrat Beto O'Rourke. He announced today he is taking some time away from the campaign trail as he recovers from a recent illness. On Friday, he was diagnosed with a bacterial infection and was treated at Methodist Hospital here in San Antonio. In a tweet, he thanked the Methodist Hospital staff and said his symptoms have improved and he's now back home in El Paso resting up. O'Rourke is going up against incumbent Republican candidate Governor Greg Abbott who was seeking his third term. Around Texas now, a scary scene in Houston overnight. Police there say a suspect purposefully set a building on fire and then opened fire on the people who tried to escape. This happened at a multi-rental property. Houston PD says the suspect used a shotgun to fire at the people. Two of those people died at the scene. Three were taken to the hospital with one of them dying later on. When fire crews arrived to the scene, the suspect opened fire on them too, but they were able to put out, out the fire either way. An officer was on scene and was able to shoot and kill the suspect from across the street. That officer is a seven-year veteran and is on administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigation. Officials say the suspect was recently evicted from the property. Back here in San Antonio, learning coping strategies and honoring their loved ones. That was the goal behind the TAP seminar for military families who have experienced loss. TAP stands for Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Their goal is to find support for families through various programs based on an individual's need. A woman says she's benefited from TAPs after the passing of her husband in Iraq, and she now encourages others to join too. I'm just happy to be here this weekend and be able to provide that support for our families, the support that um, was life-changing for myself and, uh, and for, my, for my family. And every time I leave here, I leave knowing that we've built, our, built a bigger family. Just in 2021, more than 135,000 families connected with the assistance program and their 24-7 hotline got more than 15,000 calls. Hard to believe, but five years ago, Hurricane Harvey's eye bore down on the small coastal town of Rockport. We were there. We saw what looked like total destruction. But on my trip back down there for the five-year anniversary, Rockport's harbor master told me if it weren't for just a few safety structures, there would have been even more damage. He walked me through how they're now repairing those structures in preparation for the next storm. This is really where the water meets the land. Keith Barrett was born and raised in Rockport and is now Aransas County's harbor master. I've seen our community evolve from when I was a young person to what it is now. Um, and also to know the pain of seeing it destroyed. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, was, it was tough. Barrett is heading the effort to strengthen safety infrastructure before the next storm hits his beloved town. These breakwaters protect the harbor itself, but also the land behind it. It's fascinating to see from above. This breakwater and this land here, uh, if you think about those waves coming into uh, our community, there's two schools, there's several churches, our police department, fire department, city hall. The spot where Barrett stands became an angry torrent during a hurricane captured in this picture now hanging in his office. The breakwaters put up a fight but suffered damage. And so this one obviously is cement with these rocks, but some of them are different materials. Yes, they are. Okay. Take, for instance, Rockport beach a top destination for visitors the beautiful place that it is but the fact is it serves another purpose it is a protective breakwater in its own way to the rest of rockport the beach lost a lot of sand so they'll be doing a beach renourishment to build that sand back up nearby a set of breakwaters allows boats and water in and out of little bay it was tore up quite a bit and as this week we're doing a bid to repair that it won't be cheap or easy 
The Rockport entrance breakwater will need to be fortified with more stone and concrete. A big part of shoring up this structure has to do with these massive rocks, and they don't come from here on the coast. They come from the hill country. That's why it's taken five years to through the planning stages and working with FEMA and all these organizations to get to a point that we can make those repairs. Each one of the projects comes with the portion that needs to be matched by the Aransas County Navigation District. We're very blessed that, that the federal funding has helped, but many of them have, you know, 10 to 20 percent matches that are required of us. Barrett says his department had a sizable rainy day fund five years ago it rained so uh, our portion yes it's painful but in the long run between the two groups will we have what we need of course we will and as rockport fulton continues to thrive again in spite of adversity the goal is to create breakwaters as strong as the community itself and we took several trips to the coast this month. So if you want to see more stories about the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Harvey, just head to KSAT.com. Meanwhile, the tropics have been awful quiet so far here in 2022, but uh, we are expecting some tropical moisture heading up our way this week. Right, Sarah? That's right. That's right. If you got the Sunday scaries, don't worry. There's chances for rain this week, and we could use a little bit more rain locally around San Antonio. We're going to talk about our nearly daily rain chances in the forecast ahead. First, I wanted to take a look at the aquifer. It's actually up half a foot over the past 24 hours, and unfortunately, in the pollen count, we've got both molds and fall elm which are both high pigweed is low we'll of course have an updated pollen count for you early tomorrow morning as we get that in the high today was 96 that's two degrees above the average and across south central texas we were generally in the mid to upper 90s 97 in del rio 99 in new braunfels 98 in gonzalez and 97 in pleasanton but there's a chance that this is about as hot as it'll get all week long. And that's all because we do have the chances for rain in the forecast. I'll show you a look at that and that tropical moisture that Tim was talking about coming up. Still to come on the night beat, young Jewish adults of San Antonio come together to celebrate the completion of their own Torah scroll, the importance of this sacred object to the Jewish community. Plus, now that the White House is offering some student loan forgiveness, scammers are sending offers of their own, what you need to look out for so you're not duped. And it's been a while, but America is set to return to the moon. What you need to know about the Artemis launch scheduled for tomorrow morning. When we come back. At Ashley. Well, this is exciting. America's return to the moon set to get underway Monday morning with the launch of NASA's Artemis 1. The two-hour launch window begins about 9.30 a.m. Central Time. ABC's Morgan Norwood spoke with some people who are excited to see tomorrow's launch. The excitement is growing as the countdown for America's return to the moon gets underway. I'm very pumped, so I was actually a part of the test team that tested the functionality of the rocket and the avionics. It's like seeing your work right here, you know? NASA's Artemis 1 is expected to blast off Monday morning from the Kennedy Space Center. We ran into some tiny experts who were willing to discuss the mission with us. What do you know about this rocket? Where's it going to go? To the moon? That's far. Yeah. And no astronauts on it. No astronauts? This is the test flight. The plan is for the most powerful rocket in the world, the SLS, to carry the Orion capsule into orbit. It'll go around the world once, then toward the moon, looping around the moon once before coming back to Earth. This is uh, really a test flight. We're stressing the system. This is uh, really that the risk is not low uh, on this uh, on this mission. The last manned flight to the moon was Apollo 17 back in 1972. Ross McKenzie has lived in that area since 1966 and remembers the Apollo launch as well. Something good will come out of it. I don't think we knew all the discoveries, inventions, progress we'd make even from our first time to the moon. This first mission is expected to take about 42 days to complete before returning to Earth. If all goes well with this test flight, by 2024, Americans could be going to the moon to stay. This mission being successful is a, a sign to the world and to the American people that, that we've been doing our best with, with your resources. I'm so proud of what is happening in terms of our space program and the leadership that the United States is providing to the world. I'm very excited to be here. Looking forward to tomorrow. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Cape Canaveral. It's deja vu all over again. Listen, I'm kind of excited about it. it you, you should be excited about it. It's neat. Let's go to Mars. Let's do something <laughs> we haven't done.
NASA's like Hollywood. It's run out of fresh ideas. Man, Tim. <laughs> I'll take the moon. That, that's a hot take. You know, you know who does have fresh ideas? What? Is Sarah. Okay. Because she actually says that there's rain coming again. Well, that would be fresh. That's fresh, right? Yeah. Fresh and new for all of us who put up with what, how many I, months of all okay. the heat? But I do have to say, it is going to be pretty much a repeat of like last week. Which is great. Last week was great. Yeah, yeah. It's so, not, so not, 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 this is a sequel. That's a great, great way to say it. But I wanted to start by talking about how hot this summer has been, just to put it in perspective for you. So, through Friday, the data shows that this is the hottest summer so far on record for San Antonio. And, you know, recently we've actually not been too hot. It was July that really did it, right? We've had 58, 100 degree days. We're one degree shy of being the year with the most 100 degree days tied with uh, 2009. And many of us remember these summers. 2011, the summer was particularly rough in August. And in 2009, it was particularly rough in August as well. But as we look at the high temperatures today, we were just a couple of degrees above average. 94 is the average high temperature. We were at 96 today for the high. 96 in Hondo, 99 in New Braunfels, 94 in Kerrville, and 97 in Del Rio. And as we look at the forecast for the week ahead, it is not going to be that bad. Highs are really only going to be in the low 90s, close to 90 degrees for most of the week. In fact, tomorrow is probably going to be one of the warmest days of our next seven days. And the reason for that uh, the fact that we're not going to be all that hot is we're going to have some tropical moisture working its way in from the Gulf of Mexico. This deep green color is tropical moisture. It's going to be moving over south central Texas in the coming days, keeping things humid, preventing it from being too hot, but it will be humid and bringing us the opportunity for a few showers and storms here and there. This is a look at tomorrow's future cast about a 30% chance for some isolated downpours in the afternoon, particularly after 2 p.m. But then as we head into Tuesday, that rain chance goes up to about 40%. And when we're talking about a 40% chance for rain this week, we're really mainly talking about coverage. So about 40% of the area should see some rain Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday as well. So is it going to rain in your backyard every single day? Uh, probably not, but there is an opportunity for rain every single day. And again, just the fact that there's going to be a few rain showers and thunderstorms out there, it's going to keep our temperatures down and it's going to be relatively humid as well. So just to break everything down for you, 30% coverage tomorrow, 40% Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, and then becoming a little bit more isolated as we head into the weekend. Right now outside, it's 85 degrees. It is humid. Dew points are in the 70s. It feels like it's still in the 90s and it is breezy. You wake up tomorrow and your KSAT 12 hour forecast. It's going to be a lot like the last few mornings. Pretty close to 80. Very humid and temperatures will steadily rise under partly cloudy skies. By about noon, we're going to be at 87 and it's in the afternoon there that we're going to introduce that chance for a few downpours. 30% chance. 95 degrees for the high temperature. But the humidity is going to stay in the 70s all day tomorrow. That is oppressively humid, which means that it's going to feel closer to 100, 102, 101 in Port SA, 101 Converse area, 101 Seguin. It'll feel like 101 New Braunfels, 100 in Hondo, 99 in Divine, and 100 in Poteen. As we take a look at the forecast over the next few days, again, Here's a look at uh, tomorrow. We're going to be seeing a 20% chance for a 30% chance for an isolated shower or storm. Tuesday through Thursday, a few pockets of heavy rain are possible with scattered showers and storms in the forecast and highs will only be in the low 90s. See, the numbers look good. They then do. You get the yeah, two but points. it's going to feel like 100, but that doesn't get us any hey. closer to breaking that record. I know. We might as well break it, right? That's uh, right. Guys, coming up, I am going to talk about the tropics. There are quite a few areas that the National Hurricane Center is watching, so I'll let you know about that. All right. They like to wake up in September. We'll have a preview of Instant Replay right after this. Your Texas Ford dealer. What a day. The KSAT Pigskin Classic 2022 turned out to be the most exciting day in San Antonio high school football history with three games decided by a total of five points. With more on that and what's on Instant Replay tonight, let's check it with our Greg Simmons and see how he's recovering. That's lightning in a bottle, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. That just would.
Could you believe he'd had three great games all it in the was same fantastic. day? Fantastic. That was amazing. And before the UJSA Roadrunners kick off their 2022 season this Saturday, you do not want to miss the final part of Larry Ramirez's exclusive interview with head coach Jeff Trailer and his wife Carrie. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. It's number 11. Bubba Johnson in motion. Hawkins rolling. Hawkins running. Hawkins diving. Getting it in there. He got in. He got in. Oh, wow. It will go down as the most spectacular event to kick off the high school football season in San Antonio. Three games that went down on the wire. One had to be decided in overtime in the first annual KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022. Tonight, we'll review the triple header. It was forced changes in 12's top 12. One of my one of my favorite stories. Um, so when I, got, I inducted into the East Texas Coaches Hall of Fame. Um, oh my gosh, it's a good one. <laughs> Before the UTSA Roadrunners kick off defense of the first ever Conference USA Championship this Saturday in the Dome against Houston, our Larry Ramirez has part three of his exclusive interview with head football coach Jeff Trailer and his wife Carrie, who reveals the one play she wants him to run. Up to his right, Dan Brock bearing down. San Antonio FC with a tough 1-0 loss on the road, but can they hang on to their number one position in the United Soccer League standings tonight? You will find out. All that plus, Tyler Smith ready to start at left tackle for the Dallas Cowboys. And what was the most exciting game in the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat. This would be the toughest poll I think we've ever done. Tough to choose, man. I yeah. love good football. I don't care who's playing. There was a lot of good football on KSAT 12 yesterday. 12, over 12 hours yes. of that. Yes. Good stuff. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. We'll be right back with more Nightbeat right after this. DMC Dealers. All right, we're going to begin this half hour with late breaking news from the city's southeast side. San Antonio police are working a shooting scene on East South Cross near South WW White Road. Let's go live right now to the night team's Lee Waldman. She's at the scene. What do you know so far? Well, we just got done speaking with an officer here at the Reserve of Pecan Valley. It's an apartment complex on the southeast side. He tells us they were called out here for a shooting in progress. I want to point you guys over here to this back corner of this apartment. Police say that two men were shot inside of that apartment. It appears the door was forced open. Both men are in their 20s. One was shot in the foot. The other appears to have been shot in the chest. Both were taken to Bamsey. The one who was shot in the chest is in life-threatening condition, according to that officer that we spoke with. He says at this point, they don't have any suspect information to go off of. Now, there are several people sitting in the courtyard who live at this apartment complex, but unfortunately for police and their investigation, no one seems to have seen anything at this point. It's still a very active have seen several uh, different law enforcement vehicles here when we arrived and there's still an active investigation happening in that back corner apartment just across the courtyard from where we are right now. We're still waiting on more information, but they say there doesn't appear to be any danger to anyone living in this area. All right, Lee Waldman reporting live for us tonight from the southeast side. We'll keep an eye on that. It is the most sacred object in Judaism, the Torah. The scrolls contain the compilation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Now, creating a Torah is a very holy ritual that takes months at the very least. A group of young adults here in San Antonio took on that task and today celebrated the completion of their very own Torah. <laughs> a celebration worthy of a parade. dancing <laughs> and blowing the traditional shofar. The center of the celebration, this Torah, a sacred scroll read aloud at prayer services and holidays. Containing more than 300,000 letters, the handwritten scroll takes months to complete, a task the organization Young and Jewish San Antonio took very seriously. Passed to take the values of our predecessors of the Torah, of, of tradition, and pass it on to the future and in a relevant way, in a happy and fun way. Chabad Rabbi Eli Block is the group's co-chair and says the traditional celebration of completing a new Torah is over 3,000 years old. The celebration really, really symbolizes the continuation of Judaism, the kind of the golden chain, the link of the past, present, and the future. Important that the new Torah was created by young Jewish community members, carrying these ancient traditions into a new generation, further preserving a piece of Jewish identity. 
An expert ritual scribe inked those final letters of the scroll as done 3,300 years ago for the very first time by Moses himself. Around America tonight in Jackson, Mississippi, residents there are being urged to head for higher ground as that state braces for major flooding. Record setting rain threatening to flood streets and homes as early as tonight. The Pearl River projected to crest at a whopping 36 feet late Sunday through Monday evening. That's according to authorities there. Mississippi's governor says they are actively monitoring the situation using drones to keep an eye on the water levels. So far, the state also deploying at least 126,000 sandbags to divert rising waters. Because we have seen these events as recently as 2020, uh, we have uh, a reference point and we know the damage that can occur. Scientists warn extreme flooding events like this will become more frequent as the planet warms due to climate change. A federal judge in Florida now asking the Justice Department to provide more specific information about the classified records removed from former President Donald Trump's Florida estate. This as the judge considers appointing a special master to review the seized documents. Here's ABC's Ike Ajachi with the details. A federal judge in Florida will hear arguments Thursday on former President Trump's request for a court-appointed special master, an outside expert to review evidence seized by the FBI from former President Trump's residence. They're asking for a special master because of this uh, idea they have of things being subject to executive privilege. It's not a crazy notion. Executive privilege works differently, though, and it's not absolute. It can be overridden by significant government interests. The unsealed affidavit used to obtain the search warrant was heavily redacted, but has provided some insight into the investigation. The FBI launched the search based in part on evidence from a significant number of civilian witnesses. The DOJ warning that as the investigation continues, key witnesses could face intimidation or retaliation. There's an ongoing grand jury investigation, and prosecutors have already identified potential targets with a clear indication that they're looking for more. The most important part that's redacted, though, relates to the obstruction. And that to me is what this all is going to come down to. And it's not just an obstruction of justice charge. It's exactly what actions were taken to thwart this investigation, to thwart getting back those documents. The FBI has found documents involving the most sensitive of classified material, including some on human intelligence, spies, electronic eavesdropping, and secrets from allies. Some Republicans say the Senate Intelligence Committee has questions for federal investigators. We need to get a letter out right now to the Justice Department and the Director of National Intelligence say if there really is a problem, why haven't you told us about that problem? The Director of National Intelligence confirmed her office has begun an assessment into any potential risk to national security that could come as a result of classified materials being kept at the former president's residence. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. To the latest down the war in Ukraine, shelling near Europe's largest nuclear power plant has officials concerned. Ukrainian officials say Russian forces shelled that region for 14 hours on Sunday. The Zaporizhia plant temporarily went offline Thursday for the first time in its history. This after officials say the only operating transmission line caught fire, raising fears of a nuclear disaster. People near the plant have been lining up as authorities distribute iodine tablets in preparation for potential radiation exposure. Meanwhile, fighting continues in other parts of the country. Russian missiles struck the center of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, Saturday. Back here in the U.S., the factory that many blame for the infant formula shortage has resumed production of Similac. It's the first time the popular infant formula has been back in production since February. The Abbott plant in Michigan was originally closed after an FDA inspection detected a potentially deadly bacteria. An attempt to restart production this summer was hampered when the factory flooded during several thunderstorms. Abbott believes it will take about six weeks for the new formula to begin shipping to retailers. Well, as you're planning your day tomorrow, maybe taking the kids back to school, just know that it is going to be a very humid start to the day. A look outside with live cam shows a nice view there of downtown, but it is very humid outside. Temperatures are still in the 80s. All right, taking your kids to school, it'll be 78 degrees. Picking them up, 
we expect a heat index value close to 100. And there is a 30% chance for an afternoon downpour, but really we do have better rain chances throughout most of next week. So here's what you need to know. Temperatures this week will be in the low 90s, but very humid. Rain chances, there's a chance for scattered downpours nearly every day. And I hope you'll stick around because we're gonna talk about the tropics. There are a few areas that the National Hurricane Center is monitoring, one which could potentially impact the Gulf. So I'll show you all that and more coming up in just a bit. Thank you, Sarah. Well, summer is winding down, but the box office still has a few surprises left for us. See this week's box office results coming up. And student loan forgiveness is on its way to millions of Americans, but you want to be sure it's the right help from the right people. The scams you need to know about that are already happening when we come back. Bedrooms to go. Here's a scam alert for you. As soon as President Joe Biden announced plans to cancel chunks of student loan debt for millions of people, the fake calls and emails have begun. Sure didn't take long. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz on what to watch out for before you go even deeper in debt. It's the hot subject on college campuses, relief from student loan debt. I had like oh, over 5,000 in loans just gone. I had about $6,500 in loans and now because of that I won't have that. So it's a that's big really relief, nice, yeah. yeah. And it's a big opportunity for scammers looking to exploit. The government is warning, beware of emails, texts, and phone calls like this one. This is Carol Duncan. I'm calling um, in reference to your federal student loan. Um, I need to discuss your repayment options with some new changes that have taken effect recently. Within hours of the announcement, we were already getting reports from our customers that they were getting scam phone calls. Zulfikar Ramzan says the most common scam his cybersecurity company, Aura, saw was offered to walk someone through the steps to get their money and people were getting targeted and asked hey if you want to skip ahead in the line we can actually help you get ahead and get your money first all in exchange for a fee and some sensitive information the federal trade commission says you don't need to pay anybody to sign up for the new program or the pause in payments nobody can get you in early or guarantee eligibility and never give out your federal student aid id the program isn't even up and running yet the department of education will announce it when it is and that's when you apply there's no date set but it should be before the end of the year you can sign up for Department of Education updates to be notified when the process is officially open. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. So I know we say it's like a repeat of last week, which in the last couple months was yeah. a bad thing. But this is but a good this thing. This is a good thing. Yeah, and, it was yeah. a lot of good last week. Exactly. Right, and I think it's a great comparison that this week is going to be a lot like last week because you'll remember last week it did not rain every day right. and mm -hmm. it did not rain in every location every day, but there was a chance for rain every day. And that's going to be the case this week too. Are you going to get rain in your backyard every day? Probably not, but... Scattered downpours are going to benefit all of us across South Central Texas throughout this upcoming week. Let's start with today. We got up to 95 degrees for the high temperature. Uh, 96 rather that's two degrees above the average of 94 take a look back in 2011 on this day back in 2011 we were at 110 degrees yeah in 2011 was a very hot summer not necessarily in July but in August is when we really cranked up the heat in 2011 this year it's kind of the opposite for us right July was very hot for us this year and August has, has shown a little bit of a pattern change for us highs are in the 90s rather than in the triple digits and as we look ahead to this week deep tropical moisture is going to be moving in from the Gulf of Mexico this is going to do two things it's going to make it really humid bad hair days out there all around for us this week and the second thing is it's going to pr be providing us with the opportunity for rain just about every day with that deep tropical moisture in place let's start with tomorrow most of the rain tomorrow will be across the coast across our coastal communities or those closer to the east such as Gonzales, Hallettsville, Victoria, Beeville, Goliad and then as we head into the afternoon tomorrow one or two showers or storms are going to develop around the that I-35 core or the chance for rain is about 30%, 30% coverage for a few of those downpours tomorrow after 2 p.m. And once we lose the daytime heating, our rain chances will go down for the day. 
but we are going to see a chance for scattered downpours in the forecast, widely scattered downpours in the forecast. Tuesday through Thursday, coverage should be about 40%, becoming more isolated into the weekend. And something to keep in mind is because the atmosphere is going to be so juicy, any rain that falls could be heavy at times. So we'll be monitoring for that as well. As for tomorrow's forecast, waking up at 78 degrees, it's going to be humid with mostly cloudy skies, partly cloudy during the day. Temperatures will rise. It'll be 87 around noon and then in the 90s in the afternoon with that 30% chance, particularly after 2 p.m., 95 for the high. And when we look at early tomorrow morning around South Central Texas, it'll be 73 in Bulverde, 75 in Rio Medina, 77 in Hondo, 75 in Canyon Lake, with high temperatures in the low to mid 90s. In the Hill Country, it'll be only be 91 in Murney, 94 in Rio Medina, 94 in New Braunfels, 93 in Seguin, 94 at Simpson, 95 in Hondo, 95 in Uvalde. But the thing that's going to get you tomorrow if you don't get the rain is the humidity. Dew points will be in the 70s all day, so during the peak heat of the day, it'll feel close to 100. You'll want to add like three to five degrees to what the thermometer actually reads during the day tomorrow. And so I promised that we would talk about the tropics. You know, we're starting to get into the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season. It has been a very, very quiet Atlantic hurricane season. Some people are calling it a sleeping giant, just getting ready to get going. And as you can see, there are several areas out in the Atlantic that the National Hurricane Center is monitoring for development. We've got some low end chances in North Central Atlantic and closer to Africa, but the better rain, the better uh, chance for some tropical development is out in the Central Atlantic right now, about a 70% chance that this could become Tropical Storm Danielle. Again, it's been a very quiet season. The next letter in the alphabet is only D, so Danielle would be the next uh, potential uh, storm there. Then there is an area in the Caribbean Sea that has a 20% chance of development by Friday, but beyond Friday, we're going to be watching the Gulf of Mexico carefully. It's very warm out there, which is conductive to producing some tropical downpours, so we'll be watching that carefully, uh, especially as Labor Day weekend is approaching. But what you should know for this week, though, is to keep that KSAT Weather Authority app handy. We've got a radar on there because of the scattered nature of these showers and storms. You may be seeing rain in the distance, wondering when it's going to come to your house. The radar on that app will help you with that. I use it every day. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, may Sarah. the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, coming up next, we'll take a look at the weekend box office. And it's kind of a slow weekend. We'll see who came in number one. Dragon Ball Super Superhero fell from first to fifth in its sophomore weekend, grossing $4.6 million. In fourth place, $4.8 million put Top Gun Maverick at $691 million. Beast landed in third place, earning $4.9 million in its second weekend out. I think you might be forgetting what you do for a living. Bullet Train sped up and rose to second place on ticket sales of $5.6 million. I, I can't shake the feeling that everyone is staring at me. The Invitation didn't need an invitation. The horror thriller debuted number one with $7 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. The Dallas Cowboys have a major decision to make this week when it comes to their starting lineup. And after the first weekend of high school football, we bring you the best of big game coverage. Let's head over to Greg Simmons. How are you going to choose? Well, that's just it. I mean, there's a lot to choose from, and that's the fun part about high school football, especially the first week. It's going to be hard to top. And an all-new 12's Top 12 and sub 5 8 12's Top 12. And there's some surprising upsets coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Crowd making noise. Locked back to throw. Throws it over the middle. Broken up. Intercepted. All teams in the NFL must make important decisions this week with mandatory cuts to get down to the 53-man rosters. But the Dallas Cowboys have an even more major decision to make when it comes to their starters. And it looks like a fourth-round draft pick has earned himself a position in the starting lineup for the Houston Texans. The first week of the 2022 high school football season is in the books, and it means it's time for the first edition of the best of big game coverage. We have the best fans, the best run, the best patch. Tonight we will show you. Plus, after some first weekend upsets, a brand new 12's Top 12 and sub 5 day 12's Top 12 with changes at the top. All that plus, look back at the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022 that included the most exciting triple header to ever kick off the high school football season and should be more done following the hazing instant 
at Alamo Heights High School. The Sports Guys Decide Instant Replay is live, and it is next. Again, a big congratulations to everybody at KSAT and everybody involved with that operation yesterday. It was just fantastic. It was fun, and it looked great. It so did. thank you. Good job. Thank you. Yep. And we will be right back. Oh, at Ashley. Finally tonight, something good with cats. Yeah, that's why it's good. Always good. <laughs> so there's an old saying about cats is that they'd rather change owners than move to a new home. A case in point is in Olivehurst, California. There you can buy two cats for $285,000. And the house they live in is included. <laughs> the home belonged to a cat-loving woman who passed away and donated her home to the Field Haven Feline Center. Field Haven is hoping the new owners will adopt the cats who have been living there. The proceeds will all go to support animal adoption efforts throughout the area. Pretty smart. I think they should let the cat write part of that uh, sale there. <laughs> all right, that's all of our time. Thanks for watching KSAT 12. Be sure to tune in to Good Morning San Antonio for all your latest overnight news. And all new instant replay starts right now. of instant replay before the UTSA Roadrunners kick off their 2022 season this Saturday in the Alamo Dome. You have to catch Larry Ramirez's third and final part of his exclusive interview with head football coach Jeff Trailer and his wife Carrie. And after arguably the single greatest day of high school football in San Antonio history, we will have the results in the first ever KSAT Pigskin Classic 2022 presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. But first... Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL preseason is over. Now let the regular season begin in two weeks, but not without some major decisions to be made on the NFL cut-down week. Dallas Cowboys finished off their exhibition season by edging out the Seattle Seahawks 27-26. A loss by Seattle helped Seahawks coach Pete Carroll decide who will take over for the traded Russell Wilson, and that's Geno Smith. After the Cowboys intercepted Drew Locke three times. Israel Mukwamu intercepted Locke on just his second pass of the night. And Nashawn Wright came off his man to do the same. And then the third came when undrafted rookie Marquise Bell was able to come up with this tip pass, and he's bringing it back to the 13-yard line and set up a Dallas touchdown. That led to Will Greer finding Brandon Smith to tie the game at 20-all, and then Ben DiNucci came into the game, was able to find Peyton Hendershot for the game-winning touchdown with just over four minutes left. The Cowboys edge the Seahawks 27-26. The biggest decision head coach Mike McCarthy has to make now is does he start rookie Tyler Smith at left tackle in the wake of Tyron Smith's serious injury. We got a lot of work to do next 48, 48, 48 hours. And, you know, as far as the decisions on how we'll line up offensive line, we'll, we'll, we'll get that, you know, we'll get that done in the next couple of days. I started slow, but overall played well, took care of the ball, moved the ball down the field, scored and gave us a chance. Um, you know, I think with a greater sample size, you'd be able to see more. But at the end of the day, I put it all out there and that's all I can do. Will Greer was a player on the bubble with cut day on Tuesday, but Ben DiNucci has been told tonight that he's being released to get down on the 53-man roster. Houston Texans finished up their preseason with a third win and a shutout to boot, if you will, against the San Francisco 49ers, 17 to nothing. The big story for the Texans continues to be rookie running back Damian Pierce. He's made himself a case for starting on opening day with his performance in the preseason game against the 49ers. He had six carries for 37 yards and a touchdown. Davis Mills was 6 out of 10 for 58 yards and a touchdown as well to Chris Ward to get in a little extra work before calling it a night. It was also the first game for former Aggie offensive lineman Kenyon Green, who got time with the second team after the Texans made him the 15th pick overall. I thought he did some good things. Um, you know, he's missed a little bit of time, but, um, I mean, there are some flash plays that he had. Um, but Kenyon Green is a good football player. Again, the injuries kind of knocked him back a little bit, but when he's been out there practicing, uh, we've seen these type of plays that you're talking about. For you to bring him up, I mean, everybody kind of noticed some of the blocks that he made. Um, he's right on schedule, uh, progressing the way we would like for him to. All right, the Texans now get ready for their season opening against Indianapolis Colts on Sunday, September the 11th at high noon. San Antonio FC fell on the road to Indy 11 last night, 1-0, but with an 18-5-3 record and 57 points, still holds the lead in the United Soccer League standings. The lone goal in this match was scored in the 40th minute with Robbie Dombrock found the net. Even though SAFC outshot Indy 12-5, some good news, San Antonio's clinched a playoff berth. They will head to California next week. Here's a look at that schedule. They'll be at the Oakland Roots on Saturday at 9 p.m.
Before we get to our final piece with UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer and his wife Carrie, I want to tell them thank you very much for allowing KSAT 12 Sports inside your beautiful house for what turned out to be a 40 minute interview. We laughed, coach choked up a bit, and we laughed some more. Tonight, they talk about the one football play Carrie would love to see him use in a game, and we get her thoughts about his public affection when he says things like, she's hotter than fish grease. Okay, he's always said that. That's not like something he just did here. He's always, that's, well, I mean, he's always had all these expressions, right? But that's one he's always said. And the night, I think it was for the press conference, we were here at the hotel, and you were talking about what you were going to say. And for some, and I don't know why he said I'm going to, did you say you were going to say that? Or I don't know, somehow it came up. And I was like, please don't say that. But of course he did. And apparently somebody likes it or liked it because it's, it comes back all the time. Does it really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just normal. We call him Jeffisms because he's, he's got a lot of those. He does. Does he ever practice on you? Does he? Hey, I have a new one. Here's what. I, bam! And he no, throws they it your just way. come out, and we hear about them on, you know, from friends or TV or whatever. But he's he's always. I don't know if that comes from. I don't know where that comes from because not everybody in your family does that. I couldn't tell it's you. It's you. I think your dad does stuff like that, maybe, but. Anyway, it's his thing. I think it's awesome, though, because it shows just how much he loves you. And in today's world, I mean, I know we can use more love. So when he gives you that, you know, public affection, talking to the media, and then you know that sound's going everywhere, that's just got to make you feel like a million bucks. Okay, so I, I really don't... I'm not saying I don't ever get on social media because I do, but I'm on Twitter the least, and that's what he's on the most. Okay. So I don't um, always <laughs> see it. Work. But then somebody will snap it and send it to me or whatever, and um, and I probably take it for granted because he has always been, he's always built me up. I mean, always since we were little. He's always has been a big um, supporter. He's been really good about it, and I know I I appreciate it. I just probably take it for granted. What would your kids have to say about those? Oh, they'd love this kind I, of stuff. I bet they did, right? Yeah. We have jokes about stuff like this. One of my, one of my favorite stories, um, so when I got I inducted to the East Texas Coaches Hall of Fame. Um, oh my gosh. It's a good one. I, I was giving my speech, right? And um, I noticed that there was like 40 of my family members and friends over there they had some game going and they, they were laughing and my children had created bingo cards of all my expressions through all the years so whenever I said one of those expressions in my speech they had a picture of them and they, they put were, it on there during the speech you can imagine how distracting that was you're given and you don't know you're not a part of it yeah. so I don't know what's going on and of course then I gave I guess my fifth Jeffism, and if somebody <laughs> won the bingo game, and they were like, bingo! And I'm like... That's a true story. I'm like, I figured out what's going on. Right do you ever offer him football advice, or that's just his world? Yes, you do. One, one, time, one play, she always says the same thing. Every time. It's when we're on the one-yard line, she wants to run the up and over. And I'm shotgun most of the time. So yeah. my baby's pretty hard to go up and over when you're in the shotgun. Yeah, but, but from my perspective, it looks like just jump over everybody. Just there get over go. them and then you're right. You're She's like a big one, up and over. That's her right play. There. That's her play. <laughs> Maybe we'll see it this year. Thanks a lot. That was just a great interview. Time now to tonight's instant replay poll question. What game did you find the most exciting in the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022? Smithson Valley versus Reagan, Judson versus Johnson, or Steele versus Brennan? Vote now. We have the results at the end of the broadcast tonight. Up next, a rare showing of emotion from Smithson Valley head coach Larry Hill. I'll tell you what, before we talk about Dave and our guys, you know, we lost three Rangers this year. You know, Jackson Cinney, Cody Fuller, and just a few weeks ago, Parker uh, Taylor. You know, we didn't play for them today because that's corny. That's not what we're at. But I'll tell you what, the pride and tradition and work ethic those guys established carried these guys today. And I'm real proud of those three. Uh, we miss you guys. And, and Mama... Had a good seat today, Mom. Had a good look. I miss you every day. 
It was a very emotional moment as the Rangers won their first game of the KSAP Pigskin Classic triple header in the Alamo Dome on Saturday. We'll review the big day, the three winners of the John Way player of the game. And we got the best plays from the first week of the high school football season of the best of big game coverage. An all new 12's top 12 for all of our area teams. And should more be done to discipline the football players involved in the alleged hazing incident at Alamo Heights High School? The sports guys debate this hot topic with instant replay continues live next.